Okay, right on. Well, uh, welcome everybody to week 19, 20, 18, somewhere around there of the West Talks seminar series. Um, so West Talks um, is the Water Environment Student Talks and it's jointly um, hosted by the University of British Columbia and McGill University. Okay, so it's also a joint collaboration between IC Impacts, uh, the India Canada collaboration and UBC Future Waters Group. And the organizing committee, as always, Abhishek, Jaskaran, Kumar, Furia, and myself. Um, three of us are from uh, UBC, Jaskaran's from McGill, and then Furia works here with the IC Impacts office at UBC. Okay, so here's our fall 2020 lineup. Um, we're getting getting down towards the Christmas uh, Christmas here, but yeah, we're on November 12th. Um, Dr. Lantang from uh, Tufts University. Uh, next, next week, we have Dr. Sunil Gupta from the Indian Institute of Technology. And we're still trying to um, hammer down the November 26th speaker. We've had some people um, back out of that. So trying to figure that out. And we are um, trying to line up and, and maybe change the format a bit for after Christmas. We're thinking of perhaps doing every second week um, and alternating kind of topics. So we'll, we'll keep you guys up to date with how we want to do that. Um, we've had some fantastic speakers over the last 19 or 20 weeks or so. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, but in, in hopes of not overloading our participants, we might drop down every second week. So uh, anyway, stay tuned for information on that. And as always, the previous West Talks are available on the IC Impacts YouTube channel. And it's always great to see that those views go up, up, up. Um, so people are actually tuning in afterwards to to catch up. Or if you know you, if you if the presenter mentioned something and you want to go check out a group or a case study, um, it's always available on the YouTube channel. Okay, perfect. So it is my pleasure to introduce today our speaker, uh, Dr. Lin Tang. She's a public health engineer and an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering at Tufts University. She began working in water, sanitation, and hygiene to reduce the burden of infectious disease while earning her master's degree, after which she worked at MIT until joining the uh, US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2003. She completed her postdoc work at Harvard Center for International Development from 2010 to 2012 and joined Tufts University just after that in 2012. Her main research interests is how to reduce the burden of infectious diseases by evaluating the effectiveness of water and sanitation interventions. And over the past 20 years, she's provided technical assistance or conducted research in more than 50 countries um, across the world in Africa, Asia, Central America in both developing and emergency contacts um, which I think we're going to get into a bit today, um, publishing over 80 manuscripts. She runs an active group completing lab, field, and policy research with a diverse funding portfolio. So with that, I will turn it over. And just a reminder, um, throughout the presentation, feel free to type any questions into the chat box, and we'll just kind of accumulate those. And at the end, Abhishek's going to um, yeah, introduce all the questions. So yeah, uh, feel free at any point to type those in, um, and we'll just try not to be distracted when they pop up. <laughs> So awesome with that. Um, thank you and welcome to West Talks. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great to speak. Um, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Okay, great. So I'm gonna to talk today about water sanitation, hygiene and engineering in, in outbreaks, particularly um, getting the Zoom controls. So what I wanna um, highlight first, what I wanna highlight first is that in general, in kind of the ongoing um, development context, the under five mortality rate has fallen by more than half worldwide since 1990. And you see that's true for both the under five, the light blue line, the infant um, mortality rate and the neonatal mortality rates. So that's children under 28 days old. And so we've made amazing progress kind of over the last 20 years or so. And this progress um, has shown a decline from about 12.6 million deaths a year in children to 5.6 and equivalent reductions in, um, in the deaths per day. So I wanna kind of frame that because I think a, a lot of times we don't realize how far we've come, but we also need to think about where we're looking at going. So when we look at the causes of death for children under five now, over half of the deaths remaining worldwide for children under five are related to neonatal causes or congenital or birth causes. So these are things that happen um, in development, in the womb, um, 
related to prenatal care and testing and access to safe birthing um, or, and, or infections that lead to um, death in the first 28 days. So this would be a preterm birth or something that's gone wrong in labor. Um, so half of the deaths are, are related somehow to um, pregnancy and childbirth, right? After that, um, the top three causes of death are pneumonia, diarrheal diseases, and malaria. So you're talking about air, water, vectors. This is standard environmental health, right? And then there's some specific diseases, um, meningitis, HIV, AIDS, measles. Measles is fully vaccine preventable, the first here on the list, and then injuries and then others. And so this is your real profile of, of kind of under five death worldwide. When we're looking at, at water sanitation and hygiene, we're looking at reducing the diarrheal disease burden and also um, helping to um, wash can help prevent vectors spreading, can be involved in other diseases as well. Um, within the development setting, we look at the sustainable development goals, which replace the MDGs, which are from 2000 to 2015. And the goal is to move everyone up this access ladder to have universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. So starting down at the bottom with surface water to unimproved to limited, which means you'd have an improved source, but it's more than 30 minutes from your home to basic water sources, which is an improved water source within 30 minutes to safely manage which is I think what we're used to here um, in our universities, drinking water from an improved water source located on premises available when needed and free from fecal and priority contamination. There's equivalent scales for sanitation and hand washing and kind of moving everyone up the water and sanitation ladder will help continue to reduce this childhood disease burden. Humanitarian response is slightly different and I wanna start by giving it a little bit of history to it. Um, so humanitarian response began um, when a, a man named Henry Dunant was on a battlefield in Italy after the battle. Uh, the battlefield was uh, in Solferino. And what he saw there was, um, was soldiers from both sides of the conflict dying of preventable wounds on the battlefield. And so in 1863, he formed the predecessor to the International Committee of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And in 1864, worked with 12 European governments to sign the first of the Geneva Conventions, which is on amelioration of the condition of the wounded in armies, which essentially allowed his organization, Red Cross, to go onto a battlefield after the battle was over and provide medical care to anyone, irrespective of who they were. And ICRC began with these principles that remain in humanitarian responses today, which is humanity, reaching out to those most in need, neutrality and impartiality, providing care to anyone no matter what side they're on, and not getting involved in a conflict, not taking a side, and independence, the ability of ICRC staff to make those decisions for themselves. Now, during the, the um, ICRC was then crucial in establishing international law. Actually, when the UN was established after World War II, ICRC is the reason the term NGO, non-governmental organization, was included in the UN Charter. That NGOs have a role in international governments. And ICRC also during the Cold War was crucial in responding because, because Red Cross was, was able to go anywhere. During the Cold War, um, countries were aligned with the United States or with the Soviet Union, and there wasn't freedom of travel or freedom of ability to respond during that time. At the end of the Cold War, there was a huge peace dividend, and there were many NGOs suddenly entering the humanitarian aid sector. And in many cases, they didn't know what they were doing. And there were accountability questions. Um, there were accountability questions with um, Doctors Without Borders response in Biafra in Nigeria that may have led to increased conflict. There were accountability questions around after the Rwanda genocide response when um, cholera was mistreated and 50,000 people died of cholera in refugee camps in one month and um, where a lot of the aid for the Rwanda genocide actually went to continuing the conflict. So there was a sense of the sector expanded and then was thinking about how to become accountable and how to not um, exacerbate conflicts by, by doing humanitarian response. Kind of as part of this accountability question, in um, there was the cluster system was set up, and what this is is um, when an emergency is defined, which is essentially something big enough that's happened that the 
that the national government is overwhelmed and cannot respond. So a very big hurricane where the national government is overwhelmed. Um, the second side, and we'll also talk about this, is um, when the national government deliberately um, is not providing services to part of their population, um, uh, either uh, examples of this might be Syria, right, where the, where the national government is a part of the sides of the conflict. Yemen's also in that case, Myanmar with the Rohingya, ref the Rohingya internally displaced persons in Myanmar as well. So what happens is the UN sets up a humanitarian and emergency relief coordinator and then activates a set of clusters. And these clusters will be different in different emergencies. Um, if it, there's a wash component or an education component or a shelter component or a health component, um, you would activate these 11, it's a portion of these 11 clusters. UNICEF is responsible for management of the WASH cluster. Often in outbreaks, you'll see the WASH cluster and the health cluster work very closely together. What's the cluster do? It herds cats. I mean, it herds all the response people together. Coordination, having meetings, sharing information, thinking about where the gaps are, sharing who's doing what where, strategic response, organizing funding calls. It just helps coordinate the humanitarian response. Um, it is herding cats and it's also kind of, it, without it, what would you do? But it's also um, a lot of a lot of coordination, right? Um, so I want to also introduce kind of not just how we respond to emergencies, but what um, the emergencies are. And we generally categorize emergencies into three types: natural disasters, which we consider earthquakes, eruptions, landslides, tsunamis, floods, droughts. Um, Natural disasters are, are currently increasing in both number due to climate change. For example, hurricanes are increasing in intensity, um, but also increasing in their impact due to increased population in unplanned settlements. So more people are living in areas impacted by natural disasters. We often make assumptions after a natural disaster that there'll be infectious disease. Like, oh, there's an earthquake, everyone will get cholera. And those assumptions are actually incorrect. We, we know very clearly that epidemics happen following natural disasters if one, two, one of two or both things happen. Flooding where the water stays around, which is moving the disease, it's a vector for the disease causing organisms, or mass displacement where people are moving or having to migrate. They're internally displaced persons or refugees who've crossed an international border. Um, we know that epidemics are possible and common after flooding and or mass displacement events. Um, outbreaks, um, uh, we've had a set of disease outbreaks come up over the last decade. This is kind of um, emerging infectious diseases are increasing, particularly because of population pressure that's expanding access to zoonotic diseases, um, expanding human animal interactions. We've seen uh, large increases in cholera. We saw Ebola in West Africa, the first large outbreak, which I'll talk about later. And we saw Zika come through. And now, of course, we're seeing um, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. These are increasing particularly in Africa in impacts and also in human animal exposure in Asia. Um, and then the last type of emergency is a complex emergency fragile state. And this is a donor defined definition. Sorry, there's a train going by. It'll be just a second. <laughs> out the window. Um, this is a conflict in areas where government does not support the local population. We've seen these uh, complex emergencies increase, particularly in the Middle East. This would be your Syria's, your Yemen's. Um, now, it's possible you could have an outbreak in a natural disaster in a complex emergency. For example, Haiti had the earthquake January 2010, the cholera outbreak October 2010, and the political violence throughout that time. So you can have overlapping emergencies. And what I'd really like to highlight is different emergencies have different health needs. We make all kinds of assumptions about emergencies and what the health needs are in an emergency, but they can be quite different. This is an example, uh, this is an image from South Sudan, where in fact the vast majority of the health needs were related to violence, right? It was, it was trauma and violence and reducing the conflict reduced the health needs. That's the, um, this is, um, 
a picture from Kosovo, where when the, the conflict broke out, actually the greatest health needs were in access to essential medicines um, for elderly populations. Thinking about if you have um, blood pressure medicine you have to take every day or you're diabetic or, or something like that. Um, and suddenly because of a conflict, the supply chains break down, right? So actually in Kosovo, one of the greatest health needs was access to essential medicines for the elderly, right? And, and this is an image from Haiti after the earthquake where um, the earthquake uh, kind of did this um, pancaking damage to building and what you have is health needs related to blunt force trauma, right? And so I really want to highlight that the health needs in an emergency will vary depending on what the emergency is, right? Okay, so that's a, a basic introduction to kind of the humanitarian sector some of the types of emergencies, populations, just giving a background, it might actually be a good time. I kind of have three short segments today. It might actually be a good time if it's okay. I can stop sharing and see if there's any questions, if anybody wants to ask any questions now. I don't see any. All right. Um, there aren't any questions in the chat right now. Um, anybody... Usually we have them towards the end, so. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm messing up your system. I just asked Carl. Oh, no, that, that's you know, Yeah, Carl. Sort of block with um, 11 or, or 13 or so of those elements. Um, who organizes that? Is that the UN? It's You're saying like her cats. So that, is that administered by the UN? It's organized by the UN and then the clusters themselves are partnerships between, um, like some of them are actually organized by NGOs, by non-governmental organizations, but it's the UN establishes when it's an emergency. And it has to do with whether or not I mean, I just want, we often think, oh, we're Americans, there's an earthquake for Haiti, I'm just going to hop on a plane and I'm going to go help, right? The reverse doesn't happen because the U.S. doesn't issue visas for that. It's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's overriding national autonomy, right? And the U.N. is the only organization that has the ability to override national autonomy with a vote of the Security Council. And that happened in Syria. Syria did not want humanitarian response in its country during the conflict. And there was a vote of the Security Council to allow the clusters to operate, even though the national government did not approve that response, right? So they did a cross-border response from three hubs around Syria, right, in Turkey, Jordan. And so I think um, understanding this kind of concept, nations have autonomy. And this idea that we can just flit around and respond actually depends on national governments. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Are, there, are there other questions before we go? And I'll give an example from Ebola yeah. next. Any other questions? Um, okay, there's one by Travis in the chat. Yeah. Has NGO oversight improved? If you don't uh, address this later, you'll talk about this. Yeah, I can say it has improved, but not good enough. Um, there's, a, there's a set of standards called the SPHERE Standards for Humanitarian Response, which are standards that um, are established. I help write the water and sanitation and hygiene section for that. Um, but they're not, they're not, you don't have to do them. You just say, I'm going to align with SPHERE Standards. There's standards the UN is trying to set up. There's a quality assurance project that I'm working on. Um, uh, that's led by Oxfam, that's looking at uh, what's the quality of humanitarian response. There's a lot of questions about ethics of humanitarian response. I would say, um, yes, it has improved, and this is an ongoing process. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, because I remember when the blast happened in Beirut, there were a lot of NGOs that were kind of standing by to wait and see how the government was going to respond because of concerns of what you just brought up. So that was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Just thinking about, and this is some of the difference between the development sector and the humanitarian sector for people who might be more familiar with the development sector where you tend to be in partnership with the government the whole time, right? It's just a longer term development uh, partnerships. Okay, let me go on to the Ebola. We just have one more question, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is uh, by Lely. Uh, she asked, can the United Nations overrule the national government in case of humanitarian crisis? With a vote of the UN Security Council, they can. And the first and only time they've done that in recent history is with Syria. And in Yemen, you work with both governments. So there's permission for humanitarian response, but uh, the agencies work with both governments. So yeah, so they can. OK, perfect. I guess uh, there are no more questions in the chat. So we can go ahead uh, to the next section. Yeah. So the next bit, um, let me share this. Let me get back in 
here. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about some work we've done specifically around Ebola because it links so much to what we're doing right now with SARS-CoV-2. And so this work was applied research on disinfection of surface and hands to prevent ongoing transmission of Ebola. So Ebola was identified in the 70s and there's been a number of outbreaks over the past 50 years that have always been around 50, 100, 200, 500 people. Small outbreaks. Ebola has reservoirs in animals um, that live in forests, uh, fruit bats, mammals, primates, and Ebola is introduced into the human population mostly by ingestion of that bushmeat. Um, they're mostly in DRC, Uganda. There's a very set way Ebola is responded to. Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Border handles it. They do it, they go in, Ebola is identified, they do a cordon sanitaire, they lock down um, an area within that cordon sanitaire, they put an Ebola treatment unit in the middle. Ebola has a 50 to 90% death rate. They let Ebola kind of work its way through the community um, because there's a cordon sanitaire. It ends and they leave. They've done this for 30 or 40 years. They've been the primary response organization for Ebola. In West Africa, where there hadn't been Ebola before, at the forested intersection of deep rural, rural Liberia, Guinea Conakry, and Sierra Leone, which is a place where very few people live, and the national governments, which are based on the coast, don't really have a lot of presence in those areas. Um, there was a two-year-old child who was in the forest and ate a fruit bat. That child contracted Ebola, gave it to his mother, gave it to his aunt, his aunt sought medical care, gave it to um, a nurse, and then it spread through burial practices. Ebola is actually quite difficult to transmit. You transmit it in late stage disease through, um, through bodily fluids, mostly blood, and you transmit it. It's one of the few um, viruses that lives in the body after death. So you transmit it in preparing the body. So burial practices. So it's late stage disease, bodily fluids, and after death bodily fluids. The West African Ebola outbreak, because the area didn't know about Ebola there, went unnoticed for long enough that it spread and it spread to capital cities. And you may remember people were quite scared of how far it would spread. It's the largest outbreak to date. It was greater than 11,000 deaths. It was an international outbreak of international concern. And it overwhelmed MSF's response capacity. MSF couldn't do, didn't have the doctors to respond. And so MSF, um, for the first time, kind of CDC, World Health, international agencies got involved in Ebola. And suddenly everybody was trying to do Ebola response and everybody had questions. So there are these various networks, WASH cluster, emergency environmental health forum, et cetera, et cetera, that um, were trying to answer these questions. And I took a list of the questions we couldn't answer and wrote a grant proposal and got funded. And those questions were, and just to highlight at the beginning, chlorine is used widely in Ebola to disinfect it. It's, it's, it, it, it inactivates the Ebola virus um, and it used 0.05% for living things and 0.5% for non-living things, dead bodies, surfaces, living would be hands, people. There's variation in the time, the surfaces, um, there's no recommendations for how you test or the type. So I kind of want to, so we came up with three sets of questions we wanted to answer. One is some, some basic chemistry questions. What's the shelf life of a 0.5 and 0.05% chlorine solution in these contexts? And how do you test those concentrations, right? Basic chemistry, um, then some surface cleaning. What's the efficacy of surface cleaning recommendations? And then hand washing. Uniquely in Ebola, it's recommended to wash your hands with 0.05% chlorine solution at, at the community level as prevention. Like, like we have sanitizers, you'd walk into a store now, there'd be a, a bucket of chlorine solution you'd wash your hands with. And what's the efficacy and safety of, these, of this recommendation on hands? So I'll start here, which is um, expiry. And what I want to say is chlorine and humanitarian response is not just chlorine. It's actually three compounds, calcium hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, sodium dichloroisocyanurate are widely used. Two of them are powders. Um, one is a liquid. It's easier to bring in a powder in an airplane for a response. Um, and in particular, sodium dichloroisocyanurate, which is the only acidic solution in, in solution, has a benefit that it doesn't form a precipitate. So if you're, if you're piping the solution, it doesn't end up clogging your pipes. And MSF and its Ebola treatment units 
um, has continuous flow piped network into the red zone where the patients are of these chlorine solutions, right? So there's continuous flow chlorine systems, right? And so not clogging the pipes. Last thing you wanna do is declog a pipe in an Ebola treatment unit, right? So we did a, a very simple study with these three compounds. We made little bottles of all of them. We put them in incubators at different temperatures, 25, 30, and 35. We took the bottle out every day. We tested it and we put it back in the incubator. And what we saw is your HTH and your, your calcium and sodium hypochlorite at these concentrations were rock solid over 30 days. And your NADCC lost 10% of its value within 10% of its concentration um, within four hours right at that temperature. And the reason is because it's acidic and the chlorine chemistry reactions in the acid, when it's, uh, when it's acidic, actually um, it, they, they, they're very rapid, right? And so we saw um, this rapid degradation of the NADCC compounds, right? And so our results, HGNIOCL are stable, NADCC decays in hours, days. This is a best case scenario. We're using lab water, lab incubators, very best case. Um, so this would probably be worse in an Ebola treatment unit context. And um, you want to consider your use. Are you MSF continuous flow? So four hours doesn't matter. Or are you a community tank where the tank's sitting out there for days where it does matter? Um, the next chemistry piece, which was also a relatively simple experiment, was, um, was the fact that Chlorine test kits are optimized for drinking water concentration, zero to four ppm milligrams per liter, or bleach concentrations, which are greater than 30,000 ppm milligrams per liter. The concentrations of chlorine recommended in Ebola fall right in the middle of these. So they're 500 and 5,000 ppm milligrams per liter. So um, there are some ways to test chlorine in the field that you can use. This is an iodometric titration kit, a wet chemistry kit, a wet chemistry kit. There's these DPD tests that are colorometric, right? If you have chlorine, it turns pink, meant kind of pool test kits, and but you would have to dilute to use these. And then there's a number of um, test strips. Clearly the test strips are easier, but much more expensive per cost. And this is much harder and needs more training. So we looked at which one of these would work for these concentrations. On the left, you see 0.05%. On the right, 0.5%. Orange is titration, red is DPD, green is test strips. Here, these little dashed lines are where you'd want it to be within for it to be considered accurate. You can see both of these, your titration methods, your various titration methods and your various DPD dilution methods are working pretty well. Your test strips are all over the map. And what I want to particularly point out, this is the data from NADCC, sodium dichloroisocyanurate, that has a pH of six, that's acidic. Watch these three um, in the red um, circle as I advance to the next slide. Sodium hypochlorite, pH of nine, those same test strips read the other direction, right? So the test strips themselves are pH dependent, right? And so what I wanted to get at from this is that really chlorine chemistry actually matters. And I often read a paper that's like, oh, we made chlorine at 1% and we tested it. And for me, I'm like, I need way more information than that, right? I want to know what its pH is. I want to know how you made it. I want to know if you actually tested that concentration or just assumed that the bottle was 5% and your dilution was correct. Um, and this matters for kind of your expiry time, particularly if you're storing it in a bucket over time. And then how do you test to confirm? Firm. And can you do once a week with titration? There was one test strip that worked really well, and we worked with World Health Organization to think about developing test strips for Ebola specifically. Like you could have a test strip that would be accurate at 0.5 and 0.05. And that kind of thing, that's a kind of needed. So this was the chemistry side. Um, I want to move on. I'll do surface disinfection and hand washing, and then we'll come back to questions. In, Ebola, in an Ebola treatment unit, you have two types of spills. You have what's called an uncontrolled spill, which means someone would like vomit or, or blood on the floor, and that's an uncontrolled spill. You also have a controlled spill, which is a bucket next to the patient's bed where they would um, vomit or, or defecate or, or any blood products would go in there. Uncontrolled spills you want to clean up to prevent transmission in the red zone, the green zone, the yellow zone of an Ebola treatment unit. Red zones where the patients are, you're triaging patients in the yellow and green zone. You don't want these bodily fluids there uncontrolled. Everybody has different recommendations for how to clean these up. Do you put a cloth on it, pour chlorine on top of the cloth, wait 10 minutes? Do you pour chlorine on, wipe it, wait five minutes? Like all the recommendations are all over the map. 
we wanted to figure out what we should do. So what we did is first, um, we're not a BSL-4 lab. We can't work with the Ebola virus directly, but we partnered with someone who did. And he looked, this is the degradation of Ebola after being exposed to the black line, degradation of Ebola after being exposed to um, chlorine on stainless steel surfaces only, right? So this is just one surface. And you see that after being exposed to 0.5% chlorine for five minutes, Ebola is fully inactivated right? We worked with him to replicate his experiment um, in our lab with four potential surrogates. We identified surrogates based on base pair size or morphology or capsid type. And we thought maybe MS2, 5.6, M13, or PR772 would work. We recreated these lines for each of the phages. And we found that this purple line, which is 5.6, was kind of a very good surrogate because this purple line um, is just slightly, it, it takes just a little bit more time to fully inactivate the Ebola, or the 5-6 than it does the Ebola. It takes 10 minutes instead of five minutes. So it's a, it's a conservative um, indicator, a conservative surrogate for Ebola. So then we used 5-6, which is a BSL-1 organism, so we could also put it on people's hands in the rest of our studies. What we found is we saw a three log reduction of 5.6 across our entire sample frame, because one of the benefits of working with a BSL-1 organism is you can have a huge sample frame. We did different surfaces, different chlorine types, different soil loads. We wiped, we covered, we did all kinds of things. Um, we did different contact times. We saw a three log reduction of 5.6 irrespective of chlorine type, soil load, wiping, or covering, although there was a benefit with covering because it could limit splashing, which you wouldn't want to splash an uncontrolled spill into your eyes, which could be a transmission rate. What did change efficacy was surface type, particularly nitrile, and your contact time. We found that across the entire sampling frame, 15 minutes at 0.5% chlorine, um, actually inactivated three log of the 5.6. We then went back to the BSL-4 lab and Cook ran confirmation studies of our results, and, um, and we found that that was a positive result. We presented this work to MSF, who said, we can't do that. And I'm like, tell me about that. And they're like, well, and as we all know now from COVID, um, the Ebola treatment unit is a one-way path. The, the medical professional would go in, go into the red zone, go through and go in a one-way path, right? If you saw an uncontrolled spill, you can't put chlorine on it, keep going down your path and come back to clean that spill up. You would never do that. That would be breaking your route and it's too much time. So this may be what's needed, but it is unimplementable which is a really important point. And this is actually, right now we're doing tons of work right now around surface disinfection in SARS-CoV-2. And we're expanding this, we're doing um, chlorine, copper, super towel ions, we're doing um, five different surfaces of this, we're doing three different surrogates, we're doing 5-6 MS2, mouse hepatitis virus, and also we're partnering with BU, with the National Emerging Infectious Disease Lab to look at, um, doing SARS-CoV-2, we're massively expanding this to look at, at surface disinfection relevant to SARS-CoV-2. What we're finding, as we know now, um, actually SARS-CoV-2 dies is inactivated very, 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 very easily on the surfaces. We ran our sampling frame and killed everything in 30 seconds. We then ran dilutions of our, and re-ran our sample frame, um, which was not exactly fun, but we did it. Um, and so we're kind of trying to get more evidence around surface disinfection for these viruses, because I think it's gonna be important as the viruses come down, as the outbreaks happen over time. Okay, hand washing, my last one. Um, it's unique to recommend to wash hands with 0.05% chlorine solution to Ebola. There's questions about the efficacy of that. Does it actually work? Does it, does it remove the Ebola? And the safety, because there's a concern that washing your hands with chlorine would lead to dermatitis, like in this picture, and dermatitis would cause breaks in skin that would actually increase the transmission route. Uh, no, I don't. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, we did two trials. We did efficacy where we had people come into the lab and wash their hands with soap, four types of chlorine, sanitizer, just rubbing, just water. And we spiked those hands with E. coli and 5-6 beforehand. We had them wash their hands. And then after they washed their hands, we put their hand in a Whirlpack bag and we got the any remaining orga organisms into the water, which we could test. This is called the glove juice method. And we tested both the residual on their hands 
and if there was any rinse water. Because you think about when we wash our hands, it goes down the drain and away. In an Ebola treatment unit you, or, a, or a community area, in an Ebola area, you would wash your hands and end up in a bucket. And that bucket could also be a transmission route. Um, we also assessed community risk. We had 108 people at Tufts wash their hands 10 extra times a day for 28 days using six different methods to see if they increased their hand irritation over time. Right. We worked with a dermatologist on this from Harvard um, and essentially and we're very familiar with this in SARS-CoV-2 now because um, you have you can imagine um, how many extra times a day you're washing your hands just moving around in society. You walk in a place, you take sanitizer, you go this, you you're just washing your hands extra and does that increase your irritation. All the volunteers received um, a suite of products so they would um, hyperallergenic products. So the only thing they'd be exposed to would be their hand washing. Um, Oh, here's the, okay, here's the results from the, um, uh, the hand irritation score index. Who knew there was hand irritation score index? There is one. So at the beginning of the study on day one, this was the average HEXI score, the hand irritation score. As you see, all six groups, all six different, whether it was soap, sanitizer, or the four chlorines, increased their score. It went from two to about 10 over the 20 days of the study. The score goes to, th the scale goes to 360 and it's clinically relevant at 250. So yes, irritation increased in our volunteers as we probably all noticed, but it wasn't clinically relevant and it didn't, it, there's some statistical differences in this data, but they're not meaningful. They're not clinically relevant. And so we saw irritation increase, but it wasn't problematic. Here's our efficacy data with E. coli and 5.6. And what we saw, water only, soap and water, hand sanitizer, the four different types of chlorine that we tested, everything, um, your, your with and without soil load, all of the bars show that doing just about anything gets you two to three log reduction of, um, of the E. coli or the 5.6 off your hands. And we didn't see a difference. The two statistically significant differences we saw when we analyzed the data, HTH was slightly better with E. coli and soil load and slightly water only was slightly worse. But really my, my husband looked at this data set and he was like, huh, I, why do we wash our hands again? I should just use water. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. But this is, we've done actually subsequent work around the laboratory efficacy of hand washing, and there's a lot of work to be done on establishing the laboratory efficacy of hand washing. We've done a systematic review, but actually um, this data kind of shows you're getting two to three log reduction no matter what you do, right? And so what I want to come back to say is this data essentially comes together, lots of data to say, actually use whatever method is available and acceptable because they don't, it, we're not seeing large differences between them. The one difference we saw is the chlorine based hand washing methods had less, showed less persistence of E. coli and 5.6 in the rinse water bucket, which would make sense. You've got the chlorine residual acting over time. So there's a, there's a benefit there in the rinse water, but really it all kind of came up, use what you can, which is actually a great policy result because you're not saying you have to use this, that, or the other. But so this actually ended up with a, a very good policy result. I'm gonna summarize this and then I'll come to questions. Um, what we wanted to say is for the evidence based around what to do in Ebola, um, perceived wisdom, which is essentially like a bunch of experts sitting around saying, well, this is a new thing, let's see what we think about it, is often wrong. CDC and World Health, when they pulled together their guidelines around Ebola and WASH, a lot of it wasn't right. MSF guidelines, it was very experiential. They've been running Ebola treatment units for a long time, were more often correct, but they weren't always transferable because MSF does things in these very certain ways. And when you changed it, like the chlorine expiry, you could change what was appropriate. HGH, calcium hypochlorite, performed particularly well. It had the longest shelf life, least hand irritation, highest hand efficacy. It does clog pipes. Successes we had in this, we funding was allocated knowing we wouldn't have the results for the West Africa Ebola outbreak, but we could use them later for future outbreaks. We're doing that. And it was a huge interdisciplinary collaboration. We had a donor, we had researchers, we had responders feeding in. We partnered this Ebola lab which, with a surrogate lab, which was super powerful and is exactly what we're doing again right now. I can run hundreds to thousands of samples in a surrogate lab. The Ebola or SARS-CoV-2 lab can run tens of samples and we put them together to make recommendations. Um, 
the limitations of this, and this is what will make you cry, is um, I said, it's this was reactive research. It was how is what we are recommending working rather than what should be re recommending. And I came out of this research three years ago, and I wrote a ton of grants about um, EID, emerging infectious diseases are increasing. There's eight of these diseases that World Health Organization says have the potential to um, cause worldwide pandemics uh, with few or no medical countermeasures. And those are Korean Congo virus, they're all viruses, Ebola, Marburg, Lhasa, MERS, SARS, coronaviruses, Nipah and Rift. And I wrote all these grants saying we wanted to fill the knowledge on disinfection, know what surrogates went with what pathogens, how to clean hands and surfaces, particularly for low resource health facilities, cleaning procedures, appropriate disinfectants and sterilizers, and how to do representative matrices, particularly for blood vomit and feces. And they were all rejected because, you know, we don't really need that research. A grant never dies and you dust those grants off when SARS-CoV-2 came around and we're doing quite a bit of work around surface disinfection, which will again not inform this outbreak, but will inform outbreaks further on. And I'm not the only one, like um, I've talked to um, Ali Bohm at Stanford had a similar thing where she put in a ton of grants on emerging infectious diseases. And I think that's why both of us have been able to do research on SARS-CoV-2 because we had the grants to dust off and all of hers were rejected too. It's just, we have a funding problem where we'll only fund when there's a disease. But the other thing I'll say is we've also taken this work, what we learned here, and we've done it with Vibrio cholera, where Vibrio cholera is transmitted by surfaces, particularly in the household. And we expanded our, our surfaces and now we make packed dirt for like dirt floors and we make all kinds of surfaces in the lab and we test how to spray or wipe or clean those surfaces to prevent ongoing transmission. So this is kind of a research field that we're going for. I don't know why all of this. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing because we're done anyway. Um, uh, this is kind of a research field we've we've moved into um, with the with the starting with Ebola, moving into the um, Vibrio cholera, which we did between and now with the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that's kind of the summary of the work, and I'm happy to take any questions.